Hi, my name is Martin Purnell, and welcome to the Easter edition of Off Grid Christianity, a weekly podcast for those who go or don't go to church and for those that are disillusioned. On this Easter special podcast are two guests who last appeared on our Christmas special. It gives me great pleasure to welcome back Noel Richards and Martin Scott. Hi, Noel. Please remind us who you are. Well, I'm Noel Richards, and I'm a singer-songwriter, formerly from the UK, but now based in Mallorca in Spain, and I'm delighted to be with you today. That's very kind of you, Noel. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks for helping us out. And also, it gives me great pleasure to welcome back Martin Scott. Hello, Martin. Please remind us who you are, sir. (laughs) Yeah, I might remind myself as well. When you get to uh, a little beyond 40, you have to do that every now and then. I'm Martin, Martin Scott. And uh, like Noel, I hail from the UK. I lived there uh, until I was in my 50s, actually, and then moved, actually, alongside Noel and his wife, Tricia, to Mallorca. But now we live on the east coast of Spain, near Valencia, and also commute up to Madrid. And it's great to be with you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, for those that are regular listeners, they'll know that uh, once you've appeared on uh, the show, program, podcast, whatever we should call it these days, uh, we then do an alternative quiz and uh, the Christmas edition, of course, I can't remember who won. I'm sure Martin can remind us, Noel, who won that quiz last time. I can't remember. I've had healing of the memories, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's firmly fixed in my memory bank. Oh, it's firmly fixed. Right firmly now. fixed. It was, uh... <laughs> well, just, just remind us then, please. Who, who I, I believe it was fairly decisive. <laughs> uh, in my in my favor i should add oh right well there you go then that's well there you yeah, go. I, I, I just forgot that um, <laughs> it wasn't false modesty <laughs> <laughs> so who's going to be fizz who's going to be buzz please i'll be buzz um, are you buzz martin i'll yeah. buzz <clears throat> i'll martin's be a buzz. fizz then in that case thank you very much indeed right it's okay. so buzz is easier to say so i can get it out quicker Fair I don't enough. know why it's easier to say, but it is. So Maybe because we're just more used to saying buzz than I fizz. I think that is it. Unless, of course, you play certain pub games, which you might know fizz quite well. So here we go. No, we're looking quite weird at me that way. What do you mean? Yeah. Fizz buzz. I'll explain to you later on. It's, Thank you so much. It's over a glass of uh, ginger pop and things like that. He says, moving swiftly on. Question one, then. What has the Moai tribe got to do with Easter? What has the Moai tribe got to do with Easter? They live and, on a uh, buzz. Uh, Martin Scott. Could it be that they hail from the Easter Island? Isles? Would Islands? you like to explain more, please? I can explain no more. No, that was a, well, a you're guess. right. You're right. Yes. Oh, it is. I'm the, impressed. I was just about to ask what that tribe was. I'd never heard of them in my life, but there you go. Martin yeah. Has a world view that I don't have. <laughs> yes, certainly yeah, true. The, the word tribe was slightly surreal on, on my part, but uh, they're the monolithic figures on Rapa oh, Nui. Okay. Okay. And it's normally of like their neck and head upwards, but there's like 1,200 of them still in existence there on Rapa Nui. And of course, Rapa Nui is otherwise known as Easter Island. Thank well, you. you yeah. Would that be a point to me? Oh, it's definitely a point to you. Well Thank done. You. You yeah. take an early lead. I stand in awe. Can you keep an accurate count? Oh, I can keep an accurate count. Excellent. How much is it worth? <laughs> so, yes, uh, hopefully all these questions, by the way, uh, they might be slightly surreal, but it might just help you when it comes to general knowledge in years to come. Question two, which is the odd one out? Newcastle United, Southampton, Birmingham City, Hibernian, Exeter City. Hibernium. Uh, Hibernium. Oh, Martin, I'm going to go to Noel. I'll be kind to Noel, even though you didn't say fizz. Yes, Noel Richards. I would say Hibernian. Why? Because they're a Scottish team. No. Well, that is true, but that's not. No, <laughs> that is I, true. I, I, I tell it. Buzz. I get a point for buzz. that. Geography. Buzz. Mm, it's not the answer I was looking for. Buzz. I will. Get, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a point right. just to keep buzz. you happy. One Martin point. Scott. They play at Easter Road. Well, what makes that then the other one out? Well, the theme is Easter. Mm-hmm. They play at Easter Road. The other that's Hibernian. Are... Yeah, but that's not the reason why they're East... <laughs> they Yeah, are... But you've got the right answer. He but got Easter, the, right... the connection to Easter. I was going to say Easter, but you beat me they to it. They play at Easter Road. That's their stadium. It is Easter Road. Whereas all the others... Play uh, in case of uh, Newcastle United, they play at St James's Park. 
Yes. Southampton play at St Mary's. Birmingham City play at St Andrews. And Exeter City play at St James's Park, but not that one in Newcastle because okay. it's a bit far to travel every day. So the answer is, in fact, yes, Hibernian. They do play at Easter Road, but it's not a ground named after a saint. There you go. Points. What do I'll you give you. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll give you a point as well, Martin, because you. You, you sort of gave the right answer. Question three. Why could it be important to know the age of King Charles on Maundy Thursday? Do, 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 do. Pass. Pass. Okay. Um, Maundy means command. Okay. For those who didn't know that, which was, which was me until Monday when I was writing out these questions. <clears throat> and the command is to love one another. So that's where you get Maundy from, to love one another, right? But when you go to meet King Charles in this case, because you've got that letter of invitation to get the Maundy money that every year the reigning monarch gives out, they give you two bags of money. One is, I can't remember what colour one bag is, but anyway, one bag has £5.50 in, in a £5 coin and a 50 pence coin. In the other bag are coins as in one pence, two pence, three pence and four pence coins, but it can't be used in circulation because how many times have you seen a four pence coin going around? But those coins have to add up to the age of the present monarch. So consequently, if you're having a letter through the post to say you're going to go and get your Maundy money, it'd be nice to know how old King Charles was because you could then check the purse to make sure they're giving you the correct change and then diddled you. That is, well, that's an go. amazing fact. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> this thank is you. not just your average podcast, is it? No, is, it gets worse. Uh... <laughs> so there you go. Question four. What is the connection with these following words? Good, great, holy, and spy. 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 No, this is more your realm. <laughs> Why would that be my realm? Good, great, holy, and spy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's got to have an Easter answer somewhere in that. Yeah, it's good, great, holy, and spy. Yeah. Good, great, holy, and spy. Yeah. I can hear people shouting down the radio. Well, I know this answer. Yeah, I know, but the... I didn't until Monday. Good, great, holy, and spy. Mm, what's the connection? Is there an odd one out? Like there? No. Scotland? There's a connection. No. There's a connection. Yeah. Good, great, holy, and spy. Do you want a massive big clue? Yes. Please. It's the day before Monday, Thursday. <laughs> Good Friday. <laughs> the day before. Thursday. Oh, right. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I was jumping the gun there. You were, yeah. So we have Good Friday. What's before Good Friday? Uh, Monday, Thursday. And what's the day before Monday, Thursday? Wednesday. The whole week is called what? Holy, Holy week. week. Holy Week. So Wednesday is known, depending whether you are in the Eastern Christian churches or the Western Christian churches, is known as either, in the case of the Eastern churches, Holy and Spy. And in the Western churches, it's good or great. So Spy. When, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And wow. you can ask me why, aren't you? Well, I thought it's because they show a James Bond movie on the <laughs> of Sunday. No. Oh, uh, no. But the, I'm sure they will be on ITV4, but no. Okay. So the reason it's called Spy <laughs> Wednesday is because that is a day traditionally that Judas Iscariot did what he did. And because he was there for spying. And so it's known as Spy Wednesday. Well, that is fascinating Easter facts. Yeah. A new one on me. Yeah. You see? Who needs to go to church and do theology when we can do these quizzes? Yeah, yes. deep. Deep. That's life right. changing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something. Can I just say the last question? Out of all the questions you've had over Christmas and uh, this, this Easter podcast, I'm really proud of this question. Okay. Is this the last question coming it up? Is, it is the last question, yeah. yeah. Okay. And the scores on the doors, well, it's obviously just one winner at the moment. Isn't it? Uh, question five then. In art, which bird is associated with the infant Jesus? In art, which bird is associated with the infant Jesus? Buzz. Oh, Martin Scott. I'm going to go for a dove. <clears throat> okay. Which bird? Hmm. Infant Jesus. If you go to any art places. A chicken? Yes. A chicken. Why? 
because eventually when Jesus grew up and he was crucified, we celebrate Easter with an egg. That's great logic. That's just, great logic. It was just, just yeah, a, a wild logic. guess, basically. Yeah, that's great logic. Mm-hmm. I will try another one. A sparrow? You're getting closer. We could be here a long time. It begins with letter G, if that helps. Agreed. It with a G. It's not agreed, no. But sparrow is close and begins with Well, the same G. sort of size-ish. It's not a goose, then. It's not a goose, no. That's the only bird with a G that I know. Ooh, I can give you a clue. Yeah, we need clues. It's, it's, it's one word, two syllables, and the first syllable, going back to your James Bond spy thing, it is the third film in the James Bond saga. Goldfinger, Goldfinch. Goldfinch, it yes, is. Goldfinch. A goldfinch. Oh, well said, Fizz as well. Well said, no. Yes, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. No, I am impressed. Yeah. And do you want to know why? A goldfinch. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to know why. Okay. So if you look at any artistic pictures, uh, especially from the 1400s onwards, you might see the infant Jesus holding a little, little goldfinch. Okay. And it goes back to the reason that a goldfish, its main food that it eats are thorns and thistles, oh, wow. mainly thorns. Okay. Oh, and wow. so this is all an, al- an allegory. And a goldfinch, what colour is its face? Did I hear you say red? You're right. It is red. Yeah, red. No, it, yeah. You didn't see my lips move. <laughs> <laughs> so it's Reddish. allegorical. Yeah, it's red. It's, it's really, really bright red. So it's allegorical for crowns and thorns that obviously Jesus had many years yeah. later on his head. And the blood that would obviously have come from the crown of thorns run down his face. And that, you know, this is what he was going to face in later life. So that's what the goldfinch represents. I have to say this, this um, Easter quiz was quite a tough one. It was. And it's quite ingenious. You know, the, the fact that you've delved into it. Yes. I mean, and people listening to this podcast uh, are going to be surprised at all these little things that they didn't know about Easter. Well, yeah, I mean, goldfinch, that was one of my calculations. We're drawing two points each at the moment. Ooh, Who's keeping well, scores now? I'm, I'm keeping score here on my piece of paper. I know, I could see that. Yeah. I do think you spoke a number of times without making a noise, like a fizz noise. Well, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to replay that. We'll we have to go to VAR on that one. I think so. Yes. Uh, and whilst we're going to VAR, <laughs> this is Martin do the side, which works really well on radio. Thanks for that. Uh, whilst <laughs> we, we do go to VAR, no, I believe mm. we have due a song, good sir. Tell us more. Okay. Well, this is actually the second worship song that I ever wrote. And I really wasn't making a conscious effort to write worship songs. Uh, It was just one of those things that happened. I I was sitting in the house one evening uh, looking after our son. Trish was out. I think she was at one of our church meetings in Cobham. And I just started playing the guitar and this melody happened and the words followed very swiftly so within the space of you know a couple of hours i'd written this song and and then i played it to some friends i played to a a a guy called ishmael who's well known for writing children's songs and uh, we spent a good hour looking at the words seeing if we could make it better than what it was because he said you know died for me upon a tree calvary it's very cliched but in the end we couldn't actually improve it and he said well just do it as it is so this song is probably the most popular song of all the ones that I've written or Trish and I have written over the years, and it's called You Laid Aside Your Majesty. You laid aside your majesty Gave up everything for me Suffered at the hands Of those you had created You took all my guilt and shame When you died and rose again Now today you reign In heaven and earth exalted I really want to worship you, my Lord. You have 
have won my heart and I am yours forever and ever. I will love you. You are the only one who died for me, gave your life to set me free. So I lift my voice to you. Inside your majesty, gave up everything for me. Suffered at the hands of those you had created. You took all my guilt and shame when you died and rose again. Now today. Exalted, I really want to worship you, my Lord. You have won my heart, and I am yours forever and ever. I will love you. You are the only one who died for me, gave your life to set me free. So. When you've given us the the introduction and how you were writing it or trying to see if you can prove it with Ishmael, I'm just so glad you never asked me to help you with the words yeah. because <laughs> my rhyming would have been all over the place. Oh, I well. Much, I much probably would have suggested cup of tea or something like that that rhymes with oh. me and free. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right. On to more serious things, though, if that's okay. okay. Uh, this is the Easter podcast. And... We have questions that have been going around my mind for, for several years, and also other people have been suggesting questions as well. So let's go straight to it, first of all. Your views, please, on this question. Hmm. Why did Jesus have to be crucified? Who's going to answer that first? Why did Jesus have to be crucified? Who wants hmm. to go? No? Do you want to go? I would like Martin to go first. because. <laughs> um... Yeah, why does he have to be crucified? I mean, from a, a Roman government point of view, Crucifixion was for certain types of criminals. And the fact he was crucified by himself, they viewed him as a rebel, as a resistor. They did not view him as a violent resistor. Otherwise, they would have crucified all his followers as well, which ah. is what they did. But so they crucified him alongside two other thieves. Uh, so as a Roman punishment for them, it fitted the crime and in that level, I think that is, for me, one aspect, historically. He's crucified by the Romans because I think he is resisting that type of autocratic government, call it imperial rule, 
why is he crucified? The Jews hand him over to the Romans. Uh, they want him dead. They give it to the Romans to do, to keep their hands clean. So they punish him because he's a blasphemer. And obviously they have their scriptures on their side. Anybody who hangs on a tree is cursed of God. Therefore, that will put an end to this movement very rapidly because he is not the Messiah. Uh, he is a blasphemer. Uh, and that's clear for everybody. And I think if you jump forward, that's what Paul had to deal with on the road to Damascus. He's persecuting Jewish Christians, not Gentiles, Jewish ones who are claiming that a crucified one is the Messiah. Therefore, they're only going to bring the wrath of God down on the nation. So he'd better eradicate them. Mm -hmm. Can, I, can um, I step in there, Martin? Yeah, on, um, in, no. You know, something that sort of went through my mind, just looking at the purely, you know, human reasons why Jesus was crucified. Was it true at that time that, you know, you had the religious leaders of the day in bed with the governing parties of the day, being the Romans? Oh, very so, much so. I mean, so, see, yeah. So basically they they understood that if they could keep sweet with the Romans. Absolutely. Then life would be very easy for their religious way of life. Yeah. Yeah. The course, no, but, I mean, the, the, the high priestly family are one of the richest families in Jerusalem. Yeah. And the high priest says, better that one die than that they take away this place, i.e. the temple from us, better that one die than they destroy the nation. So they sacrificed Jesus for the nation. Hmm. Now, John ironically says, of course, the truth is he's prophesying. That's exactly what is happening. So, yeah, there's a political thing going on. The book of Acts is very clear. Over and over again, it says, you crucified him, you crucified him, you crucified him. It never says God crucified him. Right. Do I believe he needed to die? Yes. But the death is at the hands of human people that God uses. But God does not punish Jesus as I grew up mm. being told. I don't yes. believe so anyway. That's right. And the more I've thought about it over the years... I can't get my head around a God who would actually punish his son or a God who is angry with his creation for actually the creation is actually doing what he said they could do. So basically when God created us, he gave us a free will. Oh, so it's sure. strange that a God who gives us free will then punishes us for exercising that free will. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's like a double think. Yeah. And I think that whole punishment theme here takes root very strongly in the days of the Reformation. Mm. They move every analogy into the law court. So you're before the judge. Oh, for what you have done, you're going to be punished. And one steps in to say, hey, I'll pay the punishment. And that's where it grows. And, and obviously Martin Luther had a real guilt problem. And I'm not minimizing that. But if you grow up in a religious society that says God is against you, mm. Guess what you need deliverance from? Yes. Guilt. So there's a cultural element. It always has been there. And I heard somebody once say that, you know, Jesus didn't die to save us from our sins. He actually died to defeat the power of Satan and uh, overthrow the power of evil. Uh, any thoughts on that, Martin? No, that's where I, I would be. That I think, I mean, the cross, what takes place there, do we, will we ever really know fully? But I think the idea that um, God is against us and Jesus turns his face toward us, I cannot find in Scripture. Mm. I mean, even when it says, you know, God turned his face from Jesus on the cross, I don't find that in Scripture. I know he quotes Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But keep reading Psalm 22. And it will eventually say, tell them he did not forsake me. He did mm. not turn his face from me. Yeah. And I think like anybody who is suffering, you often start where Jesus did, find some scriptures or something that expresses your heart. And that is undoubtedly what he is feeling. But he understands, as Paul would put into words, God, i.e. the Father, was in Christ reconciling mm -hmm. the world to himself, not was apart from Christ. Now, hang on there, Muskie. Hang on, okay. <laughs> You're going to jump in on us. <laughs> uh, well, yes and no. Nicely. I thought this question was going to go on a different tack, first of all. 
Uh, why did Jesus have to be crucified? Because I thought we were going to talk about well, all the prophecies and the reasons why in the Old Testament. But in light of what Noel is bringing to the party here on this one, it was put to me when I was becoming a Christian that when Jesus died on the cross, the sins were so great in the world that God couldn't see them because it was so great. That's why Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God didn't like what was going on. I think I've explained that correctly. If I go back in my mm-hmm. time machine 40 years ago. Yeah. yeah. How we read the Bible is obviously a huge challenge. But for me, when Adam and Eve, and we might as well put it out there, uh, I'm neither going to defend this nor say this is the truth, but I I don't see them as literal, literal, literal. But clearly the story is full of truth. But when they leave the Garden of Eden, God leaves the Garden of Eden with them. Mm. He journeys with them. I mean, the psalmist says it, even if I were to make my bed in Sheol, You'd be there. Where can I go to get away from your presence? Even though your sins be as scarlet, there's reason together. They'll be as white as wool. So we have a God that doesn't reject us, a God who walks with us. Walks with us. Yes. And for me, it becomes very visible when you think about the journey to Emmaus on the resurrection. I'm absolutely convinced the couple are a couple, a married couple. Yeah. Disciples. Hmm. And they're walking the road to Emmaus. One is called Cleopas, and Cleopas has a wife in Scripture called Mary. And they're disillusioned, the same as Adam and Eve. Right. The evening time has come when God used to show up in the garden, and they don't know who this is. And Hmm. he breaks bread, remembering, I broke my body for you. And suddenly their eyes are opened. In the Genesis story, their eyes were opened, and they saw that they were naked and had shame. Here their eyes are open, and life has come. Mm. So I think for me, it's the culmination of God leaving the Garden of Eden, walking with them, right would, through mm. death, out the other side. In the would day you that, you, Martin, that you, you will die. That, that Jesus, in that. Would Sorry, you say yeah. that Jesus allowing himself to, to die on the cross is, is a great act of love for humanity? I mean, no, for me, it's, it's certainly that. It's certainly that. And it shows, you know, God's commitment to humanity. Mm. I think there are other things going on, but I do not think it changes the heart of God toward us. No. God was always for us. Yes. There never was a time he was against us. He isn't, the Trinity is not, you know, contorted. God the Father is against us. Jesus says, I'll be for them. And the Holy Spirit is in between somewhere. Mm. The Trinity is united. God was in Christ reconciling the world. The cross did not reconcile God to us. There's no reconciliation needed. Mm. He hasn't fallen out with us. We fell out with him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So he yeah. reconciled the world to himself. Yes. Going back to a little thing you said early on, Martin, <laughs> uh, about the, the two disciples walking along uh, the Emmaus Road. For those who go, oh, how does he come up with that? There was a fantastic documentary on Channel 4. I've talked about this before on the podcasts. And it was made about 10 years ago. It's free to wear now on YouTube from courtesy of Channel 4. It's called Jesus's First Female Disciples. And mm-hmm. I can't remember the two ladies who did it. But wow, do they go into the whole history of why they believe that, you know, there are plenty of women disciples there. It is well worth having a look. And so thank you for pointing that out. Question two, fingers on the buzzers. In light of what we've just said then, uh, this is another question that's being uh, sent to me. Does God need sacrifice to forgive? Who's going to go for that one then? You really are hitting some big ones. No, why don't you have a go? I really don't think so. I I think the world is full of so many cultures and every culture has had some sort of religious deity. You you think of the Greeks with all the gods that they had. Every every civilization, every culture has had Mm a kind of a God narrative, if you like, you know, the gods must be crazy, the gods must be angry or whatever. And there's this whole thing of trying to appease the gods. If we sacrifice children, if we sacrifice this, if we do that, 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 Mm -hmm. that, then we'll have a good harvest, we'll have fertility, you know. And so it seems that down through history from a philanthropical, is that the word? Is that, is it, what's the word I'm trying to look for? From a, something to do with uh, humanity anyway, or, culture cultures have created a deity that basically needs to be appeased yeah and that's the central problem with all religions 
is that you have a God who is at gain, a God that is angry, a God, a God that needs our sacrifices to somehow make him happy, uh, to somehow make things go well for us. And again, I, I find it very difficult to have a relationship with a God that demands something of me in order for me to have a relationship with him. Yeah. So my, my earthly father never demanded anything of me he just loved me unconditionally. I had a very good experience of a father. Uh, I know sadly that isn't the case with so many people, yeah. but to me, you know, the, the love I received and the relationship I had to me is a great picture of who God is like. If I, when I think yeah. of God as father, he's one who loves me. He's not demanding anything of me. I think, you know, religion always makes you feel guilty and religion always wants you to have to do something to please God. And the great thing is we don't. So yeah. today I don't have to do anything to please God. Jesus said something very simply. He said, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. And Christianity can be boiled down to that that, that simple essence. I, I don't know if I'm yeah, way no, off key there. Or, well, which no, goes back I, I to Maundy Thursday, of course, uh, one of the hmm. previous questions. And the answer is, what does Maundy mean? There you go. <laughs> if you remember the answer. It's a, it means it's command. A good, mm. Yeah, it's a good, yeah. Yeah, good quiz. To love one I mean, another. I mean, Scripture itself says uh, sacrifice and offering you do not <coughs> desire. He, the Hebrew writer quoting the Old Testament. And I think even when we look at sacrifices, we have to really nuance it a lot. Mary, the mother of Jesus, post the birth of Jesus, has to make an offering in the temple. Mm. The offering is, quotes, a sin offering. I think it's a very bad translation. Right. But that is what is termed. That's the, that's, the, that's the offering she's making with the Old Testament. Is she in sin for having submitted to God, be it unto me according to your word, she said, for giving birth to the incarnate God? So we have to understand sacrifice as part of their culture. In fact, the Old Testament, you could argue very strongly, and it probably would be my position, it says, when you make a sacrifice, do this, do that, do the other, and don't do certain things. In other words, it's assumed this is all part of your culture, and there is to me like a correction to it. Mm. And then to me, there are two types of sacrifice. You know, uh, I, I sacrifice somebody else for my own good, or I sacrifice myself for their good. Mm. Now, God is not demanding sacrifice. He is sacrificing himself, his own reputation, everything about him for our sake. You know, it's like the um, the two women and went before Solomon. The child had died at night, one child. They come before Solomon. Now, the one who who is not the true mother, when Solomon says, split the baby in two, very happy. Yes, of course. The true mother sacrifices her own position, no let her have it, for the sake of the child. So there's two ways of seeing sacrifice. And the way that, sadly for me, what Noel has picked up uh, in critiquing is the other side of it, which is God needs sacrifice to forgive. No, God will sacrifice to give us a future. Mm. That is sacrifice. So sacrifice and offering in the sense of something to appease you, <clears throat> you've never desired. But here I am, a body to do your will. And in that, he laid down his life for us. It is God sacrificing for us, not us sacrificing for God. And you see that all the way back in, in creation story, the, the Hebrew story is unique. You know, and all the other stories is we are here to provide food for the gods. Mm. The creation story is, look, I'll make you trees. I'll make you this. Get, eat, eat of the land and later on eat of the animals. God gives us food mm. so i think everything about the god of scripture is the opposite way around to the deities of the nations yeah absolutely wow thank you i can't remember it was on a previous podcast but they said that most theologians aren't christians so it's really nice to have martin here who isn't one of the most <laughs> exactly <laughs> take that as a compliment i think it's a compliment martin. <laughs> <laughs> before we come to the next track here's a, a third question Okay, this is my question. How close is a doner kebab to the Last Supper, minus chili sauce and tomatoes? 
And I well, do have an answer for this because I did go a bit mad over the week and start to do is, my own research. So, I'm, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go no, Richard, go for it. Uh, Doner kebab. Well, a doner kebab is made from lamb, right? It is. When we speak of Jesus being the lamb of God, uh, I think there's the connection there. So, <laughs> so I'm linking the Last Supper. So maybe they had lamb with a good glass of wine. Mm-hmm. Four glasses. So, yeah, and it was four. good wine. How do we know four glasses? Uh, yeah. The Passover feast, four glasses. Uh, okay. See, this is what you get from a, a Bible college uh, degree. <laughs> yeah. You know there's four glasses of wine. Were they full glasses, do you think, Martin? I, I, I am ignorant of such things, but let's assume they were. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's my take on it. Maybe that's the only connection that you're looking for, Martin, is lamb, doner kebab, but maybe I'm totally barking up the wrong tree. Here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll find out. Martin Scott. Oh, I don't know if you'll find out from me. Uh, lamb, obviously, because it's the Passover lamb. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that is what they, uh, they ate, for sure. And I do believe uh, I've never really studied the Passover. I do believe there were four glasses of wine, the last one in which they didn't drink, because next year, Jerusalem, it right. was always their hope. Mm-hmm. In Luke's Gospel, you actually find there are two glasses mentioned in the Last Supper, if you read it quite carefully. The others just have the bread and the wine. Mm. But they, they were taken at different times through the meal. The meal was obviously highly symbolic, and uh, Jesus injected it with huge new significance. Mm. So who's going to ask me what I think then? Yeah, I will ask you. <laughs> Buzz. Oh, Martin yeah, Scott. I get it. What's your opinion about the Last Supper, donor kebabs, da di da di da Well, I'm glad you asked. And I'll have to be sounding like a respected theologian here. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? So anyway, it was part of the Passover cedar meal. The cedar is spelled S-E-D-E-R. I did not research that, what a cedar meal is. But what I can tell you is that, yes, it is lamb. And for those that like doner kebabs, yes, I'm aware that actually you, you take the lamb and then you mince it and then you put your spices in and then you condense it before you're putting it on the spit. That's why it's a lot easier to cook. And because the fat is in the mince, that's why it's a lot easier to cook. No, it's not a doner kebab at all. Neither is it. Can it be? Because tomatoes and chilies didn't come to Europe and the Middle East until after Columbus had gone over to do his thing in the Americas. So consequently, piece of use of information, but you've ever watched Carry On Cleopatra where Kenneth Williams says, infamy, infamy, they've all got it, infamy, that classic line. <laughs> and then you've had a misspent youth, you have. <laughs> you can remember things like that, infamy, <laughs> infamy. <laughs> Do you remember that line? Oh, it's brilliant. No, no. No? Oh. So anyway, someone throws a tomato at him and he, he gives a funny look on his face, you know, as only Kenneth Williams would do. Obviously, couldn't have existed. Tomatoes, they didn't know what a tomato was until about 1400, 1500s, because it hadn't come across from America. So there you go. So that knocks that back. But here now it gets interesting. And this is where I sound like a, a theologian. Lamb on Passover can't be boiled. It has to be roasted over fire. This is based on Exodus chapter 12 and has to be served with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. More about that in a minute. Now, it can't be boiled in water. And that's why certain sects of Jews used pomegranate wood, uh, which is very dry wood with no moisture content inside the wood. So that other wood, if it was burnt, would release off steam. And of course, steam, some people think, oh, you're steaming the lamb. Therefore, we can't eat it because it's got to be roasted. So certainly you said that that was steaming. Therefore, you can't eat it because it's boiling. So that's why they use pomegranate wood in certain circumstances. Matzo is the brittle flatbread and it's dry and crisp. And you, you need to drink water with it, really, because if, do you remember those games where you tried to eat a yeah. cracker and whistle? Oh, really? Yeah. 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 It's, it's the same sort of thing. Uh, it can be made from only one of five grains. That is wheat, rye, oats, barley and spelt. Go on, please ask me. What spelt is gone? Please, someone ask. What me. is spelt? What is spelt? It's, thank you. It's the past participle of to spell. <laughs> 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 I apologise. It has to be unleavened, uh, as in no yeast. That's what unleavened means, uh, and has to be made. Now, this is interesting. I think has to be made and baked within eighteen minutes. And the reason for that is it avoids any chance of fermentation. Not there would be much. 
How did they know when 18 minutes was up? Because they didn't have clocks and watches no. in those days. I think you'll find that somebody was standing in a corner and after 18 minutes, you go, do 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 boom, and they would know it's finished. Mm. Just guessing. Now, the flower for Passover requires special Passover flower that has been guarded from contacts with liquids. So they took it very, very seriously. And on average, if you want to make some over the weekend uh, with either your spelt or your um, other flour, it's normally a third to a half a cup of water and then one cup of flour. And so that's what you do. Now, the bitter herbs. I found this interesting as well because I love food based in I'm the one that has to do all the cooking in the house. So the bitter herbs, you had a choice of romaine lettuce, thistle, Mm, goldfinch, okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Uh, endive, which is uh, like a leaf vegetable from the chicory family, chervil, which is related to parsley, and eringo, which is also a thistle. And also, here you go, ox tongue, which has nothing to do with an ox, but is a spiny flower and a member of the dandelion family. So oh. those were the bitter herbs oh. that you could use. And um, mara also means bitter and can yeah. indicate horseradish or watercress and can be used on a cedar plate. But that came much later. And as somebody wow. described, that's like if you're doing a traditional Passover meal, then your marrow or your horseradish is like the brother-in-law that comes along to the feast. Mm. It came afterwards. So to sum it all up, how close is Donna Kebab to the Last Supper? Not a lot, really. Not a lot. Not a lot no. at all. No. <laughs> no. I think I'd prefer a Donna Kebab, actually. Yeah, I would have, I must admit. We have some garlic sauce as well as the chilli sauce. Yeah. So from that, this could be interesting. But uh, we're talking about unleavened bread. And if it's leavened bread, it has risen. Yes. Yes. That's a subtle link. No, what's our next song you're going to be playing, please? Well, this this is the song He Is Risen, which I wrote for Easter, funnily enough. I know that's that's a very stupid thing to say because it is an Easter song. <laughs> no, I, when I was working with Spring Harvest many, many years ago, which is this uh, event that takes place over Easter in the UK for those living outside the UK. They were short of Easter songs. They were looking for some new Easter songs. So they said, no, could you write something that maybe we could use at the event? So I went away and for several weeks tried to write an Easter song. It's very hard to write things to order. Mm. And uh, Trish and I eventually came up against a brick wall. We'd sort of exhausted all our ideas. So Trish sent me to our good friend, Gerald Coates, uh, hey. some songs with and I said Gerald can you help me finish this and so uh, Gerald came in and helped us to finish the song so it's a song written three ways myself Trisha and Gerald Coates and uh, I did happen to be in Jerusalem over the Palm Sunday weekend many many moons ago and we did a walking tour of the city and we eventually arrived at the garden tomb where it's kind of supposed Jesus was laid after his crucifixion. And uh, it's not 100% sure, but most people mm. think this could be the place where he lay for uh, that period of time. So they asked me to lead some worship, and I sang He Is Risen there. Wow. Which is probably the most memorable place I've ever sung a song, uh, thinking I'm singing a song about the resurrection, mm. just a stone's throw from where Jesus actually rose from the dead. And that was the most yeah. incredible feeling I had. And as a contrast to this particular version of the song, which was recorded in front of over 40,000 people at London's Wembley Stadium. So quite a contrast. But for me, the garden tomb beats this hands down. Wow. He is risen. Thank you. Yeah. He has risen. He has risen. He has risen, Jesus is alive. He has risen, He has risen, He has risen, Jesus is alive. When the life flowed from His body, Seems like Jesus' mission failed But his sacrifice accomplished Victory over sin and hell He has risen He has risen Jesus 
is alive In the grave God did not leave him For his body to decay Raised to life the great awakening Satan's power he overcame He has risen He has risen He has risen Jesus is alive is alive When the Lord rides out of heaven Mighty angels at his side They will sound the final trumpet From the grave we shall arise For those that are listening, we've had the pleasure of watching a video of that. I never knew that video existed. No, wow! All those years ago, yeah. What do you remember, what do you remember that time? What there on the day? Yeah, just absolutely amazing to see so many people turned out. I mean, it was just one of those amazing things that happened without social media, without the internet. 
Mm. Yeah, people, you know, writing in for tickets, <laughs> and with an 0800 number as it was in the UK at that time. You know, like one person manning the phone. Wow. And we managed to get all those people there. Just, wow. just absolutely incredible. Yeah. Watching the video there, it was quite interesting that you saw people raising their hands up in the air, and there was no mobile phone. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's just like, oh, that's why you're raising your hair, your hands, not to record anything. I was at a concert the other week, and I mean, there was one point in this concert where all you saw was phones up in the air. Yeah. People filming it, you're thinking, why don't you just enjoy the concert? It was like several thousand all yeah. had their hands, the cameras up filming a moment. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's, 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 it's strange. It is. No, it's great. It's great when they turn around the other way and you have those lighter moments. Yes. Without the yeah, light. Oh, the olden days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Zippo lighter going left and right. Yeah, now they just hold up their phones and it's just yeah, absolutely spectacular. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Well, let's go into the next question, and that's all right. We're talking about Easter. Why don't we call it Good Sunday? We call it Good Friday, but why not Good Sunday? Who's going to go for that one? Well, I haven't a clue why we don't call it Good Sunday. Is there a reason why it's not called Good Sunday? I don't know. I was hoping. Why is it called Good Friday? Why on earth is it called Good Friday? Well, I thought it was to do with the fact that it was good because he died for us on the cross. So therefore it's good. No? Martin, any ideas? I have no idea why it's not called Good Sunday, but if there's no Sunday, we are in trouble. (laughs) As what Paul said, if there's no resurrection, then forget it all. It's absolutely vital. Yeah. There's the future. It is about the death of Christ, but it's about the resurrection, as you sang now Mm. in that song. Yes. And uh, Paul, very, very clear. One, he's declared to be the son of God through the power of the resurrection by the spirit, Romans 1, 4. And in 1 Corinthians 15, if he has not been raised, we are still kaput. Yeah. <laughs> Paraphrase, we're still in our sins. Yeah. And the cross is not the central theme. No, of Christianity. The, the res- it's an empty tomb. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's what changes everything. Because and, and I think you see the transformation, Rod Tomeus. We really hoped he would, he would be the one, yeah. that he would restore the hopes of Israel, and obviously it's over. Yet yeah. another hoped for one that did not produce the goods, and you know, in full circle Romans one, Caesar is declared son of God, when the old Caesar dies, the next one mm. is the son of the divine Caesar, but uh, Paul writing to Romans says, no, no. Jesus is declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection. Yeah. I mean, thousands were crucified. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's, there's the difference. Yeah. Mm. So it should be called Good Sunday if we're going to call it. It's, it's a great, I mean, I love Easter time and the story. Mm. It's, it's just incredible. I, yeah. A question I was going to ask, I actually sent you a little WhatsApp message while that was playing, Martin, but I, I don't know oh. if you, you saw it. Yeah. But I, I said, we, we've got to ask about Easter eggs. because where on earth you know like the talk about the i don't know what you call it you know losing the sight of the the whole thing you know easter bunny Mm. easter egg hunts easter eggs chocolate all that sort of thing you know where did all that come from it's this fabrication that we have yeah we're going to turn Um, this one to martin number two what do you think well i do have a little understanding of this i thought you might all right (laughs) We get the word Easter from, I think it was the goddess Eastra, where we get the word estrogen from. Oh, my word. Ah, okay. oh, I was going to ask you that. It's the yeah. fertility. It's the fertility goddess. And so my understanding of it is, is that yet again, you know, we take pagan festivals and mm-hmm. Christianize them because that's what they did. And so they like the idea of the fertility goddess. And because we're showing that as is a new life, they used to, in those days, give eggs over. Mm-hmm as a sign of a new life and a new start and the birth. So obviously we then decided, whoa, wouldn't it be nice to have chocolate? Because chocolate has only been ran really since the 1800s. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and of course it's got nothing to do with marketing at all. No, <laughs> of course it, not. It, it is bizarre, isn't it? How it's lovely, all these right? things, yeah, Christmas exactly, you know, yeah. it's like the commercialization of yeah. the Christmas story. You know? Yeah. Please write in to ogc at accessradio.biz if I've got it horribly wrong about the fertility goddess Eastra. Uh, and the hot cross buns. What about the hot oh, cross buns? I love hot cross buns, but where on earth did that come from? Pass. Yeah. Pass. Oh, wait a minute. No. Isn't it something to do 
because if you're going into Lent, they'd get rid of all their fruit and they'd have to get rid of all their yeast and everything else like that. So throw them all in to make these buns. Hmm. There's something, maybe, maybe. There you Can go. I just say, in light of my culinary skills, I have developed, and yet again, I should patent this. If you get a hot cross bun, cut it in half, toast it, okay? I call it a hot cross slider. I genuinely made this up. Try it at home. Put your ice cream in between the top and bottom <laughs> of your hot cross bun, right? I then enjoy. Seriously, you've had nothing like it. I was with a friend uh, two weeks ago, and his wife said, would you like a hot cross bun? And I said, i tell you what, I'm not really hungry, but why don't you do this? And she looked at me very sceptically, but then tried it. And then to see her face when she bit into the, the hot cross slider was a joy to behold. I think, Martin, your talents are being wasted on these podcasts about spiritual matters because I think you should do a <laughs> – do a culinary podcast. We've just had our how to produce lamb in a certain yes. way. We've also had talk about wine today, just fleetingly, of course. Obviously. But now we're talking about ice cream sliders. Hot Hoss- cross sliders. So, you know, this is um, giving people all sorts of ideas, not just spiritual ideas, but culinary ideas. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, there was a, a lady on a previous podcast called Kendall Vanderslice, and she was on about six or seven weeks ago, and she makes bread for a living but then realized that as a Christian, she could do more than that and did a thesis on evidence of bread in the Bible. Mm. And it it was an amazing podcast. And we went into this because actually I know I made a little joke about it has risen and stuff like that. Yes. But when you think about it, you know, a little yeast, the yeast Mm -hmm. is mentioned throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. You can do lots of analogies and allegories on the use of bread in the Bible. Yes, you can indeed. So there you go. Right, well, moving on. This next question then, would Judas have made it into heaven despite his betrayal? Ooh, I've got a great thing I'd like to read to you. Please, go ahead, No. Many years ago, Trish and I went to Vermont, spent a week in Vermont Mm -hmm. with a little Anglican church there. And the guy that was the vicar, he knew a theologian that lived locally, a very famous theologian in America called Fred Beekner. Okay. Frederick Beekner was an amazing writer and theologian and wrote very creatively. And we got some of his books while we were in Vermont. And he did a thing, you know, looking at Bible characters and looking at some of the stories and looking at them in a fresh way. So I would just like to read a paragraph. Uh, it, it's from a book of Frederick Beekner's called Peculiar Treasures. And it was later included in another one of his book called Beyond Words. So I'd like to read it out verbatim because I I find it quite moving, particularly the last part. So can I just read that to you? Please do. Uh, This is what he said. There is a tradition in the early church, however, that Judas's suicide was based not on despair, but on hope. If God was just, then he knew there was no question where he would be heading as soon as he'd breathed his last. Furthermore, if God was also merciful, He knew there was no question either that in a last-ditch effort to save the souls of the damned as God's Son, Jesus would be down there too, in hell. Thus, the way Judas figured it, hell might be the last chance he'd have of making it to heaven. So to get there as soon as possible, he tied the rope around his neck and kicked away the stool. Who knows? In any case, it's a scene to conjure with. Yeah. Once again, they met in the shadows, the two old friends, both of them a little worse for wear after all that had happened, only this time it was Jesus who was the one to give the kiss. And this time it wasn't the kiss of death that was given. And I find that particularly moving, that we see this image of Judas betraying Jesus with a kiss, but maybe when they met up, in the hereafter or wherever, it was Jesus who kissed him and Wow, the kiss well, let's, of love. Let's, let's ask our resident theologian, Martin. <laughs> I just find it particularly That's interesting brilliant. to look at it that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. I, I mean, I, I have no doubt. I mean, I wrote a chapter in a book in my last words on Judas, and my last words were, I look forward to meeting you. I have learned a lot from you already. Mm. So I have I zero doubt. I, I'm not sure. I think there was despair. So I'm not sure I quite go where that author has gone. That took him to suicide. Mm. But what is amazing is his last act demonstrated how delivered he was. He threw the money back in the temple. Yeah. 
and he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver because he always had a problem with money. Yes. Yeah. Jesus did not have a problem that he had a problem with money. Mm -hmm. Jesus had a problem that he couldn't be honest. Yes. Because he just gave him the money back. Why don't you be the treasurer? Because Jesus will always vote people over money. The world votes money over people. Mm -hmm. You're not worth the job. We will sack you. We've got to make a profit. Jesus made a loss. He decided he, he would make a loss from the beginning and give the money to Judas. But Judas threw his money back. He is despairing, but he didn't stay around long enough to know that the one that you betrayed accepted the betrayal so that you could be free. Yeah. But he lived in the good of it, I believe. So yeah. I have zero doubt that we will meet Judas in age to come. There you go. Wow. Good talking point. Thank you very much indeed. One final question before we go to the, the next track, uh, which I'm going to be smiling about because uh, what happened off air with Noel and me on this one, because he lives, is the track you've chosen, I believe. Here's the last question. Was it really three days from crucifixion to resurrection? <laughs> this was asked to me to ask to you guys as well. So was it really three days from crucifixion to resurrection? There are loads of things very difficult to tie up. But there are theologians who believe he he was crucified on Wednesday. I can't remember her name, but a very famous French theologian had a whole thesis on it. Uh, in fact, I think, uh, dare I mention his name online here, uh, David Pawson believed the same thing, that Jesus, but influenced by this woman, this woman influenced him, that he was crucified on Wednesday because there are different Sabbaths around the Easter time or the Passover time. So it's not just a Friday. So it doesn't have to be a Friday. I think it's quite hard to show the Wednesday thesis, to be honest. So I think you have to go more conventional that he he died at the time of the Passover sacrifice, the next day being the Sabbath, which is the Saturday, our Saturday, rose on the Sunday. He's not in the grave three days, if you go with that by that. Mm -hmm. But obviously the Jews are counting each part of the day is a day. If you start something a minute before midnight, that counts as you started on that day, one day, two days, three days. Yeah. Uh, is how you get there. Yeah. I, do I think he's, he wouldn't be in the grave by our counting three days? No. But I think by Jewish counting, I think it, it does pass that way. Yeah, that was my understanding that yeah. they hadn't invented zero. Yeah. It might sound daft, but the, the figure zero didn't exist uh, at the time they're writing the Bible. And daybreak begins in the evening, i.e. sunset is the end of the day. Therefore, when he rose, it's not necessarily five o'clock in the morning, right? but right at the end of our Saturday. Mm. Ah, it's also be... possible. Excellent. Well, no, you've got one final track to introduce, if that's okay. And I'll give my apology to you because when you said you wanted to play Because He Lives, I mm. thought we'd have a copyright issue here because that was written by Bill and uh, what's his wife's name? Uh, is it Gloria? Gloria, correct. Thank you. Gloria. That's a bonus point to you. Well done, oh, no. Noel. Do I get a point because I met him many years ago? Well, you can tell us the story. Yeah. No, I just met him briefly. I, uh, the one occasion I went to what was then the Gospel Music Awards in, in Nashville, mm -hmm. which was a very interesting few days to be there. Never wanted to repeat it, but uh, <laughs> I went there anyway. Um, and I actually met him. And wow. I, I just said, well, thanks for that song. Because we used to, oh no, well, there was another song, something beautiful, I think something good or something like that. There were some songs that we used to sing in our church when I was a kid growing up. And I just, mm -hmm. you know, I said, you know, you've been a great songwriter over the years and I hope people appreciate it. And I'm sure you said that many times before, but that was the level of my conversation with him. That's very nice guy. That's and, very nice. Yeah. And he has, you know, he's pioneered some wonderful songs down through, uh, many years as a, as a writer. I deliberately didn't query you, Martin, as to why people might have a problem with David Pawson. But I actually met him once. He was speaking in Nelsey, and it was a big event, and he was talking about once saved, always saved. And mm. it was packed out, so there must have been thousands, yeah. hundreds. What, in Nelsey? Yeah. You I don't... think there are thousands of people in Nelsey. It depends how you count. Ah, oh, right. Because <laughs> it's a little town. It was well, about 15,000, 20,000. Yeah, I was exaggerating slightly, no. I oh, was, right. okay. I That's was. fine. Yeah. I just wanted to clear that up. You know. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, but there was about 300 there. 
in the Civic Centre where Ishmael once played as well. Anyway, uh, he came out, actually it was at the school, and as he was walking down the, the central aisle, I stood out in front of him and I said, I have a problem with this. And he very graciously, you know, amongst a throng of thousands of people, managed to answer my question. Yeah. Uh, that's where I learned a lot about grace. And then yeah. later on in life, when I was at UCB, and I phoned him up for an interview, and he very kindly sent me his book. He was he was a very gracious man. So yeah, he was. I just want to say I learned a lot from David Pawson about yeah. that. He could have knocked me out of the way, you know, and say stupid boy Pike out of the way and carry on. He didn't. <laughs> yeah. No. Yes. Next June, then, please, after my apology, which yeah. was because he lives. And yes. it's not that one by Bill and Gloria Gaither. No, just one that Trish and I wrote uh, a few years back. Well, actually, more than a few years back, but uh, time flies. So this is called Because He Lives, first line in the early morning light. Mm. Thank you. Okay, here we go.
Patricia, who collaborated with you on that. Who wrote the music? Who wrote the lyrics? We just do it together, really. Most of the time, I, I tend to come up with the melodies. And Trish, her strong point is lyrics. But, you know, it's very hard to decide who does what because we, you know, we both, you're writing together. So yeah. I come up with a melody and Trish goes, yeah, that that's good, but can you put this in? And like I say, it, it generally sort of the melody starts with me and the lyrics start with her and we kind of put it all together. That's, yeah. 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 Wow, that's beautiful. beautiful. Before we go to the, the very last question, it's just a matter of interest now. Uh, when you go incognito, let's say, to a, a church, just purely as a, to, to worship, this goes back obviously several years, and you walk in incognito and all of a sudden they, they sing one of your choruses or your, your songs. What does mm. that make you feel? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's always encouraging when, mm. when something you've done has, has sort of impacted people. Um, the most shocking revelation for me was finding people were singing it. <laughs> because there was a time when I wasn't really ma- majoring on worship songs. I was writing more story songs and stories about faith, mm. songs about faith rather. And I remember that just after Trish and I had written All Heaven Declares, and we never realized just how popular this song would become. It's really kind of been an open door for us to so many places. But I was involved in a, an event that happened in the north of England called Cliff College a Methodist college, and they have a big celebration every Easter for several thousand people. And I remember I, I'd gone along there. I'd been invited to sing a few songs, uh, not leading worship or anything like that. But just, and I remember being in the chapel because they, they tend to do things open air in the grounds because they had such a large number of people there. So I was just waiting to go and, and do my thing, and I was in the chapel, and they started singing All Heaven Declares. And I remember looking out of the window of this chapel, looking down on the crowd, you know, several thousand so- a strong singing All Heaven Declares. And I thought, well, that's weird. It had never occurred to me that people would sing anything that we've written. But just changing the subject completely, and Martin will remember this. It was the theme of a recent podcast that I did. But Martin and I have been comrades in arms for many years, fellow conspirators. We've got up to all sorts of things together over the years. We've had a lot of fun, you see. And many years ago, when we were much younger and we were only given lowly tasks in our church, which was <laughs> welcoming people to events, we were ushers or stewards at an event at Westminster Central Hall. It was packed out. There were probably over 2,000, 2,500 oh, people mm. then. Martin and I were on the door welcoming people. And do you remember, Martin, this oh, lady? I, I, think, I think I know where you're going. Keep she going. was dressed in white. She was. And she came up, <laughs> and I being fulfilling my usherly duties very responsibly, I said, would you like a song sheet? I, I, I think <laughs> we used song sheets in those days, Martin, I think. Yeah, I think it was song sheets, yeah. I don't think we were using the overhead projector or anything oh, like no, that. No, it was no, song no, sheets. No. Would, you like, would you like a song sheet? And she said, I, I won't need one of those. And I said, I think you will because they're all very new songs. So please take them. She goes, no, I won't need that. And I said, why do you think you don't need a song sheet? And she said, Martin, <laughs> she said, well, because I am the Holy Spirit. Yep. So I looked across and Martin was looking at me with a little smile on his face going, you got a right one here, son, you know. <laughs> And I said, I don't know what to do. You know, you've got a lady dressed in white who's saying she's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then and then the band struck up a song. She said, oh, I must go. I must go. Yeah. They're singing my song. <laughs> and she, she went down the aisle, you know, sort of waving at people, going, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then so Martin and I, we rushed down the aisle, took her very gently uh, but firmly, and escorted the Holy Spirit outside out of the charismatic celebration. Indeed, we did. Yes. And as luck would have it, there was <laughs> a, another little Christian gathering happening in one of the smaller rooms at Westminster Central Hall. So we sent her down there. Yeah. The presence was welcome down there, but not among <laughs> us. Not, not that presence. <laughs> oh. So, yeah. Unusual behavior. Yes, absolutely. Mentioning Westminster Central Hall, can I tell you one of my embarrassing moments? Come on. It, invo- it involves Westminster Central Hall. 
I'd gone down there. This is when we were at Crossrooms playing a load of Stephen Curtis Chapman and his Signs of Life album had just come out. And uh, I was really blown away with it. So Alliance Music, as they were called at the time, they asked us to go down. And I thought, great, I'm going to go down there and interview Stephen Curtis Chapman. Alas, that wasn't the case because he was far too important to, <laughs> to be interviewed by me, according to certain people. And not that I'm bitter about it at all. But anyway, you can imagine that at Westminster Central, there was a massive big table. He was sitting right in the centre. And there must be about 30 or 40 people there all wanting to hear him say anything. And of course, he wasn't. But he was willing to do voiceovers for the radio station, of which there were only like two or three. And so we had to put them all in. Now, there was a very well-known evangelist from Australia called John Smith, who was known, oh, known yeah. as a motorbiking yeah. reverend. Apparently, I can be read like a book, and he really got where I was coming from as a being of a <laughs> slightly off-centre, off-key. I said, well, can you do some uh, voiceovers? And his Australian accent said, yeah, mate, I can do that for you. This will be good. Why don't you do this one? And he went, hi, this is John Smith. As the actress said to the bishop, you better be listening to Porridge with Purnell, as it was called. So I thought it was very funny. And he said, you ought to get other people to do, you know, as the actress said to the bishop. So I thought, do you know what? That's a really good idea. So I wrote down on the sheet of paper to be handed in to Stephen Curtis Chapman. And so he read out a cupboard, got his piece of paper, and he said, what? He said, uh, hi, my name is Stephen Curtis Chapman. As the actress said to the bishop, and I just wanted the floor to open up. It wasn't the right thing to do, really. Ouch. No, yeah. they, don't, they don't get that over there, do they, you see? No, no humour, no. no. Different kind of humour. <laughs> they don't have the actress bishop jokes, do they? Or is it the bishop to the actress? I don't know. I think I just said to the bishop, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I, I the just said to the bishop, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I haven't got a clue why that came about. But yeah. so John Smith, bless his cotton socks, he gave me the idea and I thought it was brilliant and it died an absolute death. It died, huh? Oh, Deep completely. Up. Completely. So going from that then to our very last question, uh, and I do thank you again for giving uh, time out to do this uh, podcast special for Easter. And as you know, when uh, I start off every podcast, I say that it's for basically for people who do or don't go to church and for those that are disillusioned. Mm. And that's the audience that I'm hoping that we're going to get. And obviously encourage those that, you know, have got no problem with their faith at all. Brilliant. Hopefully you've learned something from today in nothing else, a hot cross slider. But what do you think the Easter message says to those people, Martin and Noel, for those who go or don't go to church and for those that are disillusioned this Easter? I think it says a heck of a lot. I think it uh, says hope. It says freedom. Uh, he's not in the grave. <laughs> you can describe it so many ways. It was the biggest statement of freedom the earth has ever heard. You know, Rome put him in the grave. The Jews said, we want you in there. They put a bunch of guards around it, and he bursts out life. You won't find him among the dead. So look for life. I think that's what the resurrection says. Look for life. What brings you life? And, uh, you know, if it is sitting in a, a certain setting with certain songs and is life to you, take it as life, not as control. If that's not your thing, find what gives you life and rejoice that you're alive in Christ. So for me, it is, it is full of hope, full of release. He has come to restore our hopes. And uh, we all go through times of disillusionment, with this, that, or the other, but Jesus remains absolutely steadfast. Like I quoted earlier on, even if we were to end up in Sheol, we'll discover mm -hmm. hmm, he's there waiting for me. So uh, I think Easter's an awesome time, awesome time to restore personal faith. Mm. So, yeah. Before Noel answers this one then, you said we've all been disillusioned. What brought you back out of disillusionment then? You know, I think for me, resurrection is is such a strong thing. You know, when, when I realize God, God, well, Scripture describes God as a hopeful God, the God of all hope. So he's hopeful. He's optimistic, if I put it in human terms. Mm. It's like he does genuinely look on the bright side of life. Mm. And when you realize that is the theme of the resurrection, there is hope. It doesn't matter how far down we go or what we question, I come back round full circle. You know, I'd have to work it out in my little head. But I've been a believer as in a personal committed Christian for 50 plus years. Mm. Do I ever wake up thinking, does God exist? Maybe he doesn't. 
is death just the end? Yeah, I do. But you know what? The moment I think about the resurrection, not that Jesus is alive, but you won't find his body in the tomb. It's such a dramatic transformation. You think, my goodness me, that's the God that we come to. Yeah. And I do that over and over. So for me, disillusioned people or disillusioned with church, you know, I read the other day that <laughs> the devil is not too concerned about whether we are in church. He's very concerned if we're in Christ. And there's a huge difference. You could be in church, but not in Christ. You can be in Christ, but not in church as we call it church. You'll be in the body of Christ. Mm. You'll be related to me, to you, to know whether we ever meet or not. A whole bunch of us with faith because he is risen, as a certain gentleman sang. He did. Yeah. No, sir. What do you think? Absolutely. Well, I, that's exactly what I was going to say, having just sung about it. You know, that we, we are people of a great hope and uh, we have a living faith. And yes, I, you know, the day, days when you wake up and you think, sometimes this is a crazy idea, believing in God. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when you, you think about the fact that he is risen, he is mm -hmm. alive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if that power that raised Christ from the dead is in us, yeah. what a difference that can make to us, what a difference it can make to those around us. So that's fantastic. And and look for Jesus at work in the everyday, because this is where he is. You know, he is, he's not trapped inside a building. You know, as a friend of mine once said, going past a huge church, that's God's cage. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. a gilded cage in some places where more stories put on the building. As one, somebody once said, much more stories put on the scaffolding what's actually <laughs> the real body of yeah. Christ, you know. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the power of Christ, uh, the power that raised Christ from the dead is with us and uh, every single one of us. Let's look for Christ at work in those around us, our friends, our neighbors. Yeah. And uh, I think that's tremendously exciting. I have an Argentinian friend who said to me, uh, one of the most embarrassing days, perhaps the most embarrassing day for religion, was when the temple curtain was torn top to bottom. And they realized, oh, no, we can't sew it back up because it's the Sabbath. Mm. The place where God was meant to be was ripped open so that everybody could see that's not where God is. Now go find him. Yeah. I've been very, very skeptical all my life. I always will be, most probably. And when you say that the curtain torn from top to bottom, I remember reading up on this shortly after I became a Christian, I was devouring anything about it, maybe just to disprove it. And that the reason why it's from top to bottom is that the curtain, I think was about 12 foot tall or something like that. If you were going to tear a curtain, you do it from the bottom, you try and rip it. Yeah. But this went from top to bottom. Yeah. So, you know, how are they going to do that? Did someone take a yeah. run and jump on a pole vault? And, yeah. you know, it, it didn't, it was just ripped from top to bottom. Yeah. When you look into the history and how the Romans, the Saturians, how it all worked, you know, they were at pain of death if, if they left yeah. the cave. So, you know, this idea that he was merely a flesh wound, he was okay, you know, <laughs> he'd be able to roll the stone back and get him out. No, they weren't. No. no. You know, and that's me. I, I keep being disillusioned and keep being pushed yeah. back all the time. But at the end of the day, I'd like to think that if we ever have to go through that horrible time that Christians have gone through in, in past years and in, in Russia, you know, where gun was put your head, you know, do you believe as a Christian, you know, that, that Jesus existed? Yes or no. And if you say yes, we'll pull the trigger. Hopefully that never happened to us, but I haven't seen any evidence to suggest otherwise. Yeah. For and sure. it's, uh, Tim Hughes wrote in his song, the greatest day in history. And so that yeah. the day of resurrection was the greatest day in history of all yeah. the days. That's so, what should be called the greatest Sunday. Yeah, yeah, we're celebrating the greatest day. Yeah. Noel, Martin, thank you very much indeed, guys, for another fantastic podcast. And I, I can't thank you enough. And hopefully we'll be able to do another Christmas one and I'll come up with another quiz. Okay. <laughs> Pleasure. Great. Thank you, guys. Cheers. God bless. Bye-bye.